I'm Richard Wagaman. So what is the secret of Shakespeare's creativity? It's that Shakespeare was a pen name and that his works were not written by the traditional author, whom I like to call the Merchant of Stratford. There is no way to connect the works to his life experience, education, or personal conflicts. That is a dead end. The single most important key to understanding Shakespeare's creative genius is to recognize that the real author was Edward de Vere, Earl of Oxford. As Sigmund Freud once wrote to a friend, Shakespeare of Stratford has nothing going for him as author, while Oxford has nearly everything going for him. Some influential trends in literary criticism misleadingly downplayed the role of the author in works of literature. Otherwise, the lack of fit between the ostensible author and the works of Shakespeare would have been even more glaringly obvious than it is. Having begun with that basic secret, let me share some further reflections on the psychology of Oxford's stunning creativity. Despite my disingenuous question, there is no single answer about the secret of Shakespeare's creative genius. If nothing else, Shakespeare teaches us again and again to beware of oversimplification and instead to tolerate complexity. Shakespeare was phenomenally self-aware, and he used his profound insights into his own psychology to shape his literary works. Cynics say self-knowledge is always bad news. Well, it was, at least some of the time, for Shakespeare. It goes without saying that Shakespeare was a born genius. Adherents of the traditional authorship theory stop there. They make the patently false but widely believed claim that creative writers, that great creative writers, do not write about their own experiences, but only about what they imagine as in Shakespeare's sonnets. But that is a profound error based on a false binary between inborn genius and life experiences. A closer study of creative writers shows them constantly blending their imagination with what they have lived through. Shakespeare was the pen name of the Earl of Oxford, who also had a world-class education that nurtured his voracious curiosity about every subject known to man. His resulting phenomenal erudition played a pivotal but often overlooked role in his works. We are learning that it is not really true that original work comes from narrow super-specialization. Instead, cross-fertilization of ideas from widely disparate fields can be blended into new discoveries. Neuroscientific work on creativity amplifies this observation. Nancy Andreasen is a biological psychiatrist who has a PhD in English literature. She wrote a 2005 book, The Creating Brain, The Neuroscience of Genius. She speculates about the neural basis for flashes of insight that she confirms can occur during dreams or dreamlike states. She says, creativity involves an unusual freedom of associations without the usual censorship that can limit our awareness of them. Her PET scan research demonstrates that, quote, randomly wandering unconscious free association correlates with activation of almost all association cortex it is as if the multiple association cortices are communicating back and forth, not in order to integrate associations with sensory or motor input, as is often the case, especially when awake, but simply in response to one another. The associations are occurring freely. They are running unchecked, not subject to any of the reality principles that normally govern them. End of quotation. Oxford's genius included his insatiable thirst to understand how people communicate with one another. This led him to study and contribute to the classical field of rhetoric. In so doing, he anticipated Freud, 
by 300 years in discovering the crucial role of unconscious communication. Sir Brian Vickers calls Shakespeare, quote, the greatest practitioner of rhetoric in English literature. We might pause to contrast this view of Shakespeare with a core Stratfordian misconception best stated by Sir Stanley Wells, who said in the documentary film Last Will and Testament, Shakespeare was not all that learned. In a new book, Nimi Parvini calls that misconception a misleading myth that has helped to find past Shakespeare scholarship. By contrast, Quentin Skinner joins Vickers, Parvini, Colin Burrow, and Jonathan Bate in seeing Shakespeare as the Renaissance humanist that he surely was, noting that it was classical and Renaissance texts on rhetoric that helped Shakespeare, quote, get his imagination on the move. Again, imagination turbocharged with scholarly learning. For example, I believe Oxford took to heart the Roman author Quintilian's insight that, quote, the prime essential for stirring the emotions of others is first to feel those emotions oneself. Further, Quintilian knew that our reason is often ruled by our emotions. Referring to the judges in a legal case, he said, quote, what they wish they will also believe. Long before Freud, Quintilian knew about wish fulfillment, and this insight shaped Oxford's plays. Oxford's skill in unconsciously communicating with his audience was probably enriched by Quintilian's statement that, quote, there is also available the device of dissimulation when we say one thing and mean another, the most effective of all means of stealing into the minds of men. Unconscious communication is a central aspect of clinical psychoanalysis, but it has been neglected in the psychoanalytic study of literature. Like a good psychoanalytic interpretation, creative writers communicate with the reader or audience on both conscious and unconscious levels. Good writers find ways to activate networks of association in our implicit, less conscious memory systems where our emotionally charged memories are stored. They do this in ways that are easy to miss. An example in Shakespeare is Caesar's famous dying words in Latin spoken to Brutus, et tu Brute, or even you Brutus, then die Caesar. A biblically literate audience would be unconsciously reminded of the similar dying words of Jesus also being quoted in the Greek New Testament in his native language of Aramaic. Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani, or my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? And Jesus is here quoting the first words of Psalm 22. This subliminal comparison with Jesus would make the audience more sympathetic with the autocratic Caesar's questionable character. One way Oxford creates a direct line to our unconscious mind is by his characteristic use of ambiguity. In his sonnets, for example, his syntax is often unclear, so what we initially thought he was saying gets turned around by the end of the sonnet. Creative confusion was a typical hypnotic induction used by the master hypnotist Milton Erickson. It leaves the confused subject or reader more open to being influenced outside our usual conscious channels, so we're less protected by our skepticism. Another example, another important example of Oxford's unconscious communication was discovered by Stephen Booth in what he called unrealized puns in Shakespeare's works. He's referring to passages that easily suggest a relevant pun to the reader, who then feels she is the one who has discovered the pun, enhancing her interest in Shakespeare by giving her a sense of collaboration with him. After reading Booth's article, I wrote to him about a phrase in Richard III, where the title character refers to this mountain on my back, referring explicitly to his hunchback, but also bringing to mind the fact that he is a mountebank, which is a word used five times in other Shakespeare plays. Booth agreed. Let me now say more about Shakespeare's sonnets as another window into Oxford's creativity. 
First, a warning. Stephen Booth, one of the most brilliant commentators on the sonnets, said, quote, These sonnets can easily become what their critical history has shown them to be, guideposts for a reader's journey to madness. Similarly, Helen Vendler says, quote, Perhaps total immersion in the sonnets, that is to say, in Shakespeare's mind, is a mildly deranging experience to anyone. Why would this be? Bendler says it's partly because Shakespeare borrows his language, topics, and imagery so broadly, then proceeds to subvert them all. Quote, he is a blasphemer in all realms. He was a master subverter of all the languages he borrowed. There is no social discourse that he does not interrogate and ironize. Fendler observes that the drama of the sonnets derives from the changes of topic or syntax, since these changes mimic changes of the poet's mind. Of the multiple meanings that Booth discovers in the words of the sonnets, he says, quote, These poems go in generally for far-fetched effects. Booth emphasizes Shakespeare's complexity, which is a crucial aspect of his creativity. Quote, it is the complexity, I think, that gives the sonnets what critics call the magic of the sonnets, the sense they give of effortless control of the uncontrollable. Booth speaks of the, quote, multitudinous statements, ideas, ideals, standards, and references that almost every line of the sonnets contain. Further, he says that they may all be incompatible, but active in the sonnet nevertheless. So Oxford asks that we tolerate not only complexity, but even contradictions. How can this be? Perhaps because Oxford recognized as well as any writer that our own individual identity is complex and even contradictory. I did love you once, Hamlet tells Ophelia. After she replies, indeed, my lord, you made me believe so. Hamlet then adds, I loved you not two aspects of Hamlet's identity with two opposite feelings. Now, I acknowledged, I emphasized the word I and I loved you not to make this point, but I think it's implicit in Shakespeare's text. Let me now turn to Oxford's surviving letters for further insights into his literary creativity. Although many of these letters are businesslike, they do have many parallels with phrases that appear in the works of Shakespeare. For me, the most moving of the 80 or so extant letters was written to his brother-in-law, Robert Cecil, a month after the death of Queen Elizabeth in March of 1603. This letter is full of the sort of complex sentences that suggest a mind comfortable with complexity. My favorite passage is the following description of Oxford's grief about losing the queen. In this common shipwreck, mine is above all the rest, who least regarded, respected, though often comforted of all her followers, she hath left to try my fortune among the alterations of time and chance, either without sail to take advantage of any prosperous gale, or without anchor to ride till the storm be overpassed. There is a doorstop of a book by William Fowler titled Shakespeare Revealed in Oxford Letters that gives many, many more examples of connections between words in the letters and passages in Shakespeare. I regret that Fowler's book is so overly inclusive that you have to separate the signal of strong connections from the surrounding noise of much weaker ones. Oxford was said by a contemporary composer to have a professional level of musical skill. There is a version of the Psalms that was set to music and bound with Oxford's Geneva Bible, and they are now at the Folger Shakespeare Library. With Roger Strittmatter's help, I showed that this, that this was the now unfamiliar psalm translation that most influenced the works of Shakespeare, especially the 14 psalms that Oxford marked with unusually large and variably drawn pointing hands in the margins. Scholars have noticed the importance of music in all of Shakespeare's plays. Oxford probably resonated with Quintilian's remarks that, quote, 
poetry is song, and poets claim to be singers, and the art of letters and that of music were once united. Oxford reunites them. He wrote many song lyrics for the popular Elizabethan songbook called The Paradise of Dainty Devices. He had a genius for evoking music with words. Echoing the musical version of the Psalms allowed him to do this by reminding his Elizabethan audience of the hymn tunes they sang in church every Sunday. The Psalms constituted most of the lyrics for these hymns. The editors of a recent edition of the anonymous 1589, The Art of English Poesy, which I have argued was by Oxford himself, emphasize his view that poetry is primarily an auditory, not a visual art. Oxford believed, quote, the ear is the essential gateway to the mind. He divided all figures of speech into those that appeal to the ear, those that appeal to the mind, and those that appeal to both. Most major composers since Oxford's day have written music inspired by his works. Matthew O'Quin in the December 19, uh, 2019 New York Review of Books says that Shakespeare gradually influenced Verdi to change how he wrote operas, culminating in Othello. A nice example. Another central dimension of Oxford's creativity was his unsurpassed imagination. Among other things, he made explicit the role of his audience's imagination in collaborating with the playwright and actors in order to fully appreciate his plays, as when the prologue of Henry V says to the audience, let us on your imaginary forces work. This is a few lines after the chorus speaks of ascending the brightest heaven of invention or imagination. Just ponder. For Oxford, imagination is a way to ascend to heaven. Oxford also viewed imagination as a guidepost on the way to madness using Stephen Booth's imagery. Oxford compared the imagination to a mirror, which in his day might be accurate or might well be highly distorted. He goes on in that 1589 work, quote, even so is the fantastical part of man, that is the imagination, if it be not disordered, a representer of the best, most comely and beautiful images. If otherwise, that is a distorted imagination, then it doth breed chimeras and monsters in man's imagination. As when Horatio says of Hamlet, who alone has not only seen but heard the ostensible ghost of his father, quote, he waxes desperate with imagination. Or when Gloucester says of King Lear, the king is mad, woes by wrong imaginations lose the knowledge of themselves. Or again, as Theseus famously observes in Midsummer Night's Dream, the lunatic, the lover, and the poet are of imagination all compact or knit closely together. Othello's word thus as he kills himself uh, at the near the end of Othello, is a fascinating, if chilling, example of Oxford's awareness of the impact of flashbacks, as Othello is telling his listeners what story he wants to be told about him in the future, about his past loyalty to Venice as a soldier. His story of killing a Turk in the past invades the present at the very moment that he slays himself. Flashbacks are inherently dramatic, as they play with the audience's sense of time and invade the audience's sense of the safe barrier of the proscenium. What motivated Oxford to persevere in his prolific creative career, despite his controversial reputation and opposition from powerful enemies, such as, as his father-in-law, Lord Burley, and his brother-in-law, Robert Cecil? As Roger Strittmatter has noted, only a single word written in the margin of Oxford's Geneva Bible represents his own thoughts rather than merely repeating key words from the printed text. This one word is continue, and it is written above a biblical passage whose verse number is underlined. The verse reassures the believer that God above will reward one's good deeds. This passage is in the Apocrypha, 
in Ecclesiasticus, chapter 11, verse 21, which states, quote, Marvel not at the works of sinners, but trust in the Lord and abide in thy labor. For it is, is it, it is an easy thing in the sight of the Lord suddenly to make a poor man rich. Perhaps one literal example in Oxford's life is when Queen Elizabeth rewarded Oxford for a book in which he often addressed the Queen in the second person. And this, again, is the anonymous art of English poesy. And I've written uh, about it, uh, citing lots of evidence that I believe it was written by Oxford himself. Scholars believe the book was written around 1586, although it was not published until three years later. One passage in the book reminds Queen Elizabeth that past monarchs throughout history rewarded their favorite writers financially, and the Queen began giving Oxford a generous annuity of a thousand pounds per year in that same year, 1586. Did Oxford find inspiration in the Bible for writing anonymously? Possibly. Matthew 6, verses 1 through 4, admonish us not to seek attention for our good deeds. And Oxford underlined eight words in verses 1 and 4 that emphasize this message. And I will try to reflect the words that are underlined by emphasizing them more loudly as I quote uh, these two verses. Take heed that you give not your alms before men to be seen of them, or else ye shall have no reward of your Father which is in heaven. And that thine alms may be in secret, and thy Father that seeth in secret, he will reward thee openly. Oxford may have viewed his writing as anonymous charitable gifts to the general public. And we know he spoke, showed special interest in the word alms in his Bible, A-L-M-S, since it was one of the key words he wrote in the margin the most often, including with the largest letters of any of his annotations in the entire Bible. Early loss of a parent is frequent in the biographies of highly creative people. Children may react to loss with a feeling of being special and entitled to special treatment because of their loss. This reinforcement of underlying narcissism may have been exceptionally strong in the case of Oxford, since upon the death of his father when he was only 12, he replaced his father as Earl of Oxford, the oldest and most socially prominent earldom in the land. It was famously said that the thought of being hung in a fortnight concentrates the mind wonderfully. Michael Stepniewski on the blog Shakespeare in October 2019 suggests that Oxford suspected his political enemies would make sure he never got credit for his literary works, quote, and that was the fuel he needed, close quote, to inspire his creativity. I like that hypothesis. Oxford made powerful enemies at a time when it put his life at risk, yet he had a seemingly irrepressible need to express his opinions and his feelings. He perfected the art of what Quintilian called dissimulation. Just as his characters often resort to masks and disguises, so did Oxford. To start with, he disguised his authorship of most of his works through anonymity, pen names, or alonyms. Uh, alonym means using the actual name of someone else as the author of his works. In an article last year, I presented multiple lines of evidence that the young Oxford was the actual translator of Ovid's Metamorphoses, signed by his uncle, Arthur Golding. Um, what a contemporary called Oxford's fickle mind got him in trouble with Queen Elizabeth repeatedly yet he was also one of her favorites. She locked him in the Tower of London for a few weeks, then banned him for court for some two years after he impregnated one of her ladies-in-waiting. Her rage over this hints that she was jealous. A contemporary called Oxford one of her favorite courtiers. She was incensed when he defied her repeated orders to dance for the visiting French ambassador. Yet she awarded him that unprecedented annuity of a thousand pounds, starting when he was 36, with wording that suggested it was for some secret work on her behalf. 
that may have included writing history plays that warned the public against civil war and which placed the Queen's Tudor ancestors in the best possible light, bending the truth when necessary. Another secret of Oxford's creativity was his astonishingly profound empathy. It is said that Shakespeare seems to know us better than we know ourselves. He was gifted at stepping outside himself and seeing the world from the point of view of all of his characters. That is one reason they are so lifelike. Their creator understood them non-judgmentally. Studies have shown that children who are bilingual from an early age have greatly increased empathy with others for life. Oxford learned Latin for, from Sir Thomas Smith as a young boy and went on to master several other languages as well. An important example of Oxford's empathy was for Queen Elizabeth. One scholar, Susan James, solved the riddle of Kate's reversal from shrew to docile wife at the end of Taming of the Shrew, by pointing to striking parallels with an incident in the life of the Queen's favorite stepmother, Catherine Parr. In other words, Oxford was writing for the Queen as the most important member of his audience. Recent scholarship has debunked the old myth that Shakespeare wrote primarily for the groundlings at the Globe. No, he wrote primarily for court performance. That helps explain why an entire scene in Henry V is in French, entirely in French, which would have been understood at court, but not at the Globe. Inspired by James' research on Taming of the Shrew, I have proposed that Shakespeare's beloved character, Falstaff, was created partly to help the Queen reconcile her deeply conflicting feelings about the father who allowed her to be Queen of England, but who also had her mother executed when she was only a toddler. Wait, you may be thinking. Queen Elizabeth has been dead for centuries. If Falstaff was created for her, why is Falstaff still so popular? Excellent question. This reflects another facet of Oxford's creative genius. He was constantly writing on multiple levels, simultaneously. His works are like a colossal Bach fugue only they are far more complex than even a five-part fugue, which Bach is rumored to have been able to improvise on the organ. You know the many fat jokes about Falstaff. One scholar observed, Falstaff's fatness is the most thoroughgoing physical designation we ever get in Shakespeare. By the time that Henry VIII died, the once slender king's weight had increased to over 350 pounds. Contraptions were needed to get him up and down stairs. The only time lever is used in all of Shakespeare's work is when Falstaff refuses to lie on the ground just before the Gads Hill robbery, asking his men, Have you any levers to lift me up again, being down? So, let me now move to the opposite end of the social spectrum from Queen Elizabeth. Although Oxford makes many jokes at the expense of commoners, there are also moments when he proves to be an earl with a social conscience. In Pericles, one fisherman says, I marvel how the fishes live in the sea. Another explains, Why, as men do a land, the great ones eat up the little ones. I can compare our rich misers to nothing so fitly as to a whale. Many recent studies suggest that increased wealth correlates with decreased empathy for the poor. We find another example of empathy for the poor in King Lear. As Lear is about to seek shelter in Mad Tom's hovel during the storm of Act Three, he has an epiphany about his previous neglect of the poor. Lear says, Poor naked wretches, wheresoe'er you are, that by the pelting of this pitiless storm, oh, I have taken too little care of this. Take physic, pomp. Expose thyself to feel what wretches feel. Lear then disrobes. In his Geneva Bible, now at the Folger Shakespeare Library, Oxford annotated only one verse in the entire Gospel of Mark, and it was chapter 10, verse 21, which says, and Jesus beheld him, the rich man, and loved him and said unto him, One thing is lacking unto thee. Go and sell all that thou hast and give to the poor, 
as a rich man himself, it is understandable that Oxford would have special interest in this well-known story. Oxford's personality had all the contradictions of a Shakespearean character. His attitude toward money is but one example. He could be generous to a fault. He showed no regard for the impact on his finances of a 14-month trip to the continent when he was 25 and 26. He was successful in his appeal to the queen for his generous pension, but he was apparently unsuccessful in his many bids for other royal favors that would have been profitable to him. He showed poor judgment in his investments and risky ventures. Oxford had good reason to consider himself to be a repeated victim of the greed of other people, especially when much of his father's fortune was stolen from him while he was a ward of the court for nine years of his childhood. One of the most helpful psychoanalytic studies of creativity is by William Niederland. He writes of the role of the loss of loved ones in the backgrounds of creative artists. The artist then attempts to compensate for this loss through the use of her imagination. It can become a compulsion to achieve mastery over especially painful losses. We might think of Oxford's distant relationship with his parents, as was typical of his class. He was sent away from home to live with his tutor, Sir Thomas Smith, some two years in his early childhood. He was then sent to Cambridge University when he was eight. His father suddenly died when he was 12. And as I said, he was victimized by the highly predatory wardship system with little apparent contact with his mother, who died when he was 18. Niederlein also found a pronounced streak of personal secrecy in the creative artists he analyzed. Oxford kept his authorship of his greatest literary creation secret. Niederlein also found what he called a relentless struggling and bargaining with fate, universe, and God, a struggle that had to be kept hidden. One is reminded of Hamlet, one of Oxford's most autobiographical characters. Niederlein found that creative artists were constantly seeking new relationships, which were often precarious because of their, quote, angry outbursts, episodes of breeding inactivity, alternating with fits of near frantic productivity. Oxford was known to be extremely temperamental, but he sought out the companionship of other creative people toward whom he could be most generous. Finally, a few comments on a seemingly esoteric but universal facet of the human mind. We all have separate self-states adapted to our work lives, to our friendships, to our sexual lives, to our aesthetic experience, to our roles as parents and siblings, to learning a new language, and so on. Self-states created at different ages, starting in childhood, never fully disappear, but may recede into our unconscious minds, appear ghost-like in our dreams, and are sometimes reawakened by relevant later experiences. We can call a self-state, quote, an organized system of behavior and experience whose elements are bound together by some common principle and which is separated from other such states by a boundary that is more or less permeable. And that's from a book by John and Helen Watkins. Philip Bromberg defined a self-state as, quote, an internally coherent aspect of the self with its own narrative, its own memory configuration, its own perceptual reality, and its own style of relatedness to others. Bromberg described the normal self as, quote, a multiplicity of self-states that, during the course of normal development, attain an aggregate experience of coherence that overrides the awareness of their discontinuity. Bromberg wrote of the reader's identification with Sherlock Holmes, quote, When a creative author is able to find language to embody in a piece of writing his own internal dialectic between normally incompatible self-states, such as, for example, horror, and humor. He evokes a similar self-state disjunction in the reader. This offers us valuable insight into the psychology of our response to Shakespeare's plays and poems. One feature of Shakespeare's writing is his capacity to stir concordant responses in the reader to affective states depicted 
in his liter literary works. That includes the influence of Oxford's self-states in his creative process, which then tap into corresponding self-states in us. Oxford illustrates an unusual degree of cooperation among his multiple self-states. This may be a more accurate description than the older psychoanalytic formulation that creative artists have more access to their unconscious. Oxford had an unusual ability to look at a complex problem from multiple points of view without one perspective dominating all the others. The multiple restrictions placed on him also created problems which he attempted to solve through his creative works. Repeatedly, he addressed taboo topics such as court politics in a veiled way. He seems to have been acutely aware of his mortality and to have coped with that by seeking immortal, if anonymous, fame through his writing. He wrote as though he felt a deep emotional kinship with writers he admired, both living and long dead. The film Anonymous depicts Oxford hearing voices that shaped his writing. This may have been true. Some successful creative writers have admitted that they hear their characters speak aloud to them. Anne Tyler is one example. Oxford's mind was a sharp contrast with the way most of us think, using compartments and too seldom holding contrasting ideas in mind simultaneously. But Oxford subtly pushes us to expand the boundaries of our tolerance of conflict and complexity.